start with the backup by Professor Watt Kang or K. It's a regular research program of by A.D. Madras, and it's been with us for a long time. And we'll be giving a lecture on linear time series analysis. Part two. Thank you. Um, first correction right away. Uh, the title is not Linear Time Series Analysis Part 1, as it is printed in the program, but it's Microphone Measurements in Thermal Acoustics. And of course, there's a story behind that change in title. Uh, it was about September, October last year when Sunshine sent around a preliminary program for the workshop here. And it also hit a uh, point on the agenda saying Network Modeling. And I went back and wait, switch it, stop. I think we have an extra tangle workshop on network modeling exclusively. So I don't think we should have this here on the uh, experimental methods workshop, which was wrong. I should have network modeling workshop with another idea that I've been involved in. <laughs> anyway, I, su I suggest instead uh, that we should do something on uh, linear time series analysis. Because I know that this is an important topic. Uh, all the Groups that are good in experimental work in acoustics, they are experts in linear time series analysis. How to massage your time series such that eventually you got out the phase and the amplitude of the pressure signal at a particular frequency, so to speak. And I think the exact details on how to do this are sort of like the, uh, the family jewels, right? They're the, the secrets to success. And I thought much like Maria, okay, let's, I sit down and learn about these things and brush up the little I know, so then. Come January, February, I can give the presentation uh, here at the workshop. Well, okay, the semester started and November passes, December passes, and I realized by the end of January I won't make it. I don't find the time to really read up on linear time series analysis. And there was a point when I called for help, uh, and help came in the form of Arun Pangirala, who's a professor here at IIT Madras. He had visited us in the last summer and the year before. A very nice short courses on estimation theory and the state space analysis and stuff. And I knew he could also talk very competently about linear time series analysis as such, which he will do tomorrow. But then Professor Tangirada also said, but hey, I don't know anything or very little about thermoacoustics, so we need some uh, something to bring this together, time series analysis and thermoacoustics. And then I talked with Maria also, and we decided to split the measurement section into the classical or non-acoustic measurements and the microphone measurements or pressure-based measurements. You could also read pressure transducer here. I use a synonymous of the microphone at this point. Okay. Uh, as you can see here, I'm presently, I, did, I missed the round of introductions this morning, so I'll, I'll that right now and at Technische University at Technische University in Munich. Uh, it'll be 15 years uh, this summer that I've been professor there. Before that, I was at uh, ABB Corporate Research, which is now also. And uh, much of what I will talk about today actually goes back to those days. So I would also like to acknowledge the contributions of these three gentlemen. Oliver Pascherite, you may know, he was back then a colleague. The two of us, so initiated by uh, ideas of Thomas Sonnenberg, the two of us started the work on, on film acoustics at ABB at that time. Uh, Patrick Flohr and Andreas Schmidt were uh, visiting diploma students from Berlin or Kotter, I'm not quite sure. And uh, these, uh, Flohr and Schmidt, they were the first ones to do uh, two microphone, multi multi microphone. And, and uh, this picture here, it shows the setup. Uh, I put this in during Nicolas' talk because I realized in his presentation you find that very same image of a flame. I remember drawing this on my Macintosh tool at this <laughs> with 40 megahertz compute power <laughs> many, many years ago. And somehow it has been handed down to the generations it seems. So I can still find it in. But it's also. a new No, no, you had one slide, but it's exciting. I was going to say this is actually a poor image of a. Yeah. Green premix flame because green premix premix flames are low emission flames are blue, whitish blue. Uh, this was sort of a naive candlelight sooty flame. Uh, but I saw that in your presentation today, so watch out, it's all there. Okay, so the outline of my talk. 
a very simple first of all, talk about one microphone measurements, what you have to do attention to if you try to measure pressure fluctuations uh, in the very hostile environment that a combustion chamber represents. Then I'll talk about two microphone measurements. Uh, with two microphone, you can get additional information, not only pressure, but also oops, the camera, sorry. So pressure and velocity. The next point you can be used by mathematical induction. Uh, but I will wrap this up with multi-microphone measurements, uh, which is a more robust way of doing what you're trying to do with two microphone technique. And have some model-based regression approach, which is in a sense taking this multi-microphone idea to its uh, logical conclusion or to, to further limits. And then some more far out stuff is actually something that uh, Suchit here uh, uh, brought me in contact with, which is the, uh, the thermal acoustic inverse product, if there is enough time to do that. But before that, something completely different. Uh, here on the, on, the, on the right, you see Richard Feynman, a famous physicist, a Nobel Prize for inventing his own version of quantum mechanics, uh, besides Schrodinger and Heisenberg. And to the left, you see a book uh, written by Feynman on quantum electrodynamics, QD. And I read that book when I was a graduate student uh, of physics at City College in New York. And I was taking a class on, on uh, quantum electrodynamics. And it was a really tough course. Uh, the professor was Punchi Sakita. And the textbook was by uh, Sakurai. And, uh, Sakita and Sakurai in combination almost made me convince uh, because it was really tough going. And then I came across this book here, which is about the same subject, but completely in layman's terms. No equations. And finally, in, in the introduction, he says, well, I've uh, decidedly uh, taken out all equations because we got this from Polo. So this is the one equation reduces the real shift by half. Nevertheless, Feynman continues, I've tried very hard to not cheat you on the physics. So he did a very good job, I think, uh, on explaining the physics behind QED without any, any equations. And I, I read this book really, I remember it sort of in one setting. I opened it at 7 o'clock in the evening, and I finished 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning after a couple of cups of coffee, because I finally understood what I had been doing on these last few years. That was by, by Sakurai. And it's actually a transcript of a, a bunch of lectures by the gave, so you can still watch those uh, links here, here provided. Why do I bring this up? Because an important part of, uh, for me, an important takeaway message from this book was the concept of a phaser to represent oscillations and to represent wave propagations. So oscillation, often you see, everybody's probably familiar with this, you can represent that as some amplitude times an exponential with the frequency times time factor uh, and the square root of minus one here. And then the convention is, of course, to say, well, the real part is what we call physics, is the uh, physical quantity that we're interested in. And uh, so here's a phaser diagram, the real part of this y, the, uh, the imaginary part. Uh, the phase angle here is the product of omega times t. And as time increases, uh, this phaser is going around in circles. I'm sorry, the animation is a bit too fast on. Uh, of this uh, presentation now. But clearly, the projection of the phase around the real axis gives you the amplitude in real space. So you can use that to represent oscillations as a pendulum position or velocity of a pendulum as a function of time. But you can also represent it to depict wave propagation. So here, now we have two variables, uh, x and time position. In the propagation of the, uh, in the direction of propagation and time. For the time again, we have the omega t, and for the space dependence, we have the wave number x here. And how to read this diagram? That's important. And what's to come also? So I'll go over this uh, slowly. Uh, say here, I posit this is a snapshot of uh, this function, a complex value function, at one instant in time as a function of x. So let's assume at that particular instant in time. Uh, the, the, the phase, the omega t, is such that this phaser points straight upward at position uh, x equals 0. 
So if it straight, points straight upward, it's a purely imaginary number. And the real part of it is zero. So our amplitude of the wave at that position is zero. That's the uh, magenta line here I'm bringing down. So amplitude is zero. Now, as I step further down, the phase, the kx factor here, uh, starts decreasing. So my, my, my phaser is pointing further down. And after a quarter of a wavelength, it's pointing in a purely real direction. So that is where the blue line comes down and meets and cuts through the real plane and meets here the, the amplitude. And as I move further down, the phaser keeps rotating until it points straight downward. Uh, it's hard to draw this, and I didn't have the time to fill a nice animation to get the method, so use a bit of imagination. But again, after half a wavelength, the phaser points straight down. Zero real part, that means zero amplitude across the here zero and amplitude line, and then it keeps going, and straight up again, and so on. So this is how the phaser diagram stretched out in space uh, displays the wave field. And of course, now you see, as time goes on, if I shift the whole pattern uh, in the direction of propagation, I see that I, I get a wave propagating in, in one direction. And that, uh, Feynman, just to finish the story about Feynman used that, and then I'll do real acoustics, uh, a classic in measurements versus quantum measurements, that is not the idea. <laughs> uh, Feynman, for example, uses that to illustrate why light travels in a, in a smooth path. Now he says light, as it travels, also has a phaser, which is probability in quantum mechanics. So for each step forward, the, the phaser of a, of a, of a photon uh, chain uh, advances, the phase changes. And now if you uh, consider particles traveling from a starting point S to an observer P, in quantum mechanics, the photons are free to move as they please. They don't have to follow the straight line. Some will, but many won't. Some people also will go on these paths or that path, and so on and so forth. Now the important thing is, because that path here is much longer than this path, it will have a very different phase. And that is indicated uh, down here. So here, uh, we have a plot of the phase of the various paths, A, B, and so on, up to G. And the little arrows here, they indicate where the phaser is pointing to. So you'll see these paths, for example, the, the two down here, there are different paths, and they have different, very different directions of the phaser. Only the paths uh, C, D, E, which are the straight line, or paths very close to the straight line, they have rather similar directions of the phaser. Why is that? Well, because the straight line is the shortest connection uh, between the two points. Schroeder's connection means the path length has a minimum, and if you are close to a minimum, then the neighboring values are also not very far away, because that's what a minimum is all about, right? Zero, zero of, the, uh, of the derivative. Now, that, that means that the neighboring paths of the straight line have a phase, the direction of this arrow here, which is very similar to the straight line. And now, if you add up all these guys, you realize that all the paths that are sort of out here they give wildly different contributions. Uh, they have wildly different directions. And if you add up these contributions from the paths out here, they don't add up too much, because adding uh, means taking one arrow and put the foot uh, to the tip of the next arrow, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, these first contributions, they don't get anywhere. You make some progress, you build up amplitude, you build up probability of arriving here, only for the paths that are here close to or at the straight line. That means, quantum mechanics-wise, you can have a slip arrangement where you block these paths away from the straight line, and it won't affect much the result because the outline paths don't contribute much to the result anyway. And this is how I show that uh, light paths, light travels in, in straight line by looking at how the phasers uh, superpose constructively or destructively. And then another example of Feynman goes on uh, to talk about uh, the refraction for mass principle. And it's the whole story of uh, somebody drowning in the water and the lifeguard being here on duty. So what is the quickest way for the lifeguard to get from, the, from his post to the drowning person? Well, it's not uh, 
it's running all the way uh, with high speed here. And, and uh, I'm sorry, it's not a straight line. A straight line is the shortest distance, of, but it would have a longer duration because it spent a disproportionate amount of time in the water so your velocity is much slower, but it's some compromise in between. Uh, and that compromise you can also find, again, with an argument based on phasers and figuring out the travel times, the phaser blast that, is, that goes along with the travel times, and then this idea of superposition and so on. And this has been a very uh, important idea for me, even though the response of premix frames with distributed time delays is beautifully explained with this uh, type of argument. I won't talk about this today, instead I'll talk about wave propagation. And of course, characteristic waves in acoustics are represented just in that structure as I presented. Uh, however, if we talk about uh, duct acoustics, we usually look at waves traveling in two directions, plus x minus x. So the uh, plus x direction would correspond to the y that I've discussed previously, exactly the same argument structure. Uh, the wave number here is simply the ratio of angular frequency and speed of sound. If there is no mean flow, if there is some mean flow, there is a correction divided further by one plus Mach number, because basically, if the mean flow helps the uh, wave traveling in the x direction to propagate the effective propagation speed increases. Uh, conversely, the wave traveling in the opposite direction has to swim against the stream, and therefore the wave number for this one here is a little bit larger because you divide it by 1 minus the Mach number rather than 1 plus the Mach number times something else. So that is the, uh, the important analogy here. And uh, Yeah, uh, that's, that's something you can also illustrate now. If you imagine that this is a resonator, a straight section, here is a closed end, here is an open end. You can, argue, you can also think about how do I establish standing waving here. So I'm again, this is the resonator, I'm the wave, here is my, here's my face, and I start out with, say, a purely real amplitude here. Hard end means pressure is not done. So as I move a bit down, the phase propagates. Uh, here, according to frequency and distance, I have a certain phase reduction. And as I keep moving down, more, more and more phase is, is reduced. Now here at the hard end, I'm reflected, so I'm turning around, and the forward propagating wave turns into a backward propagating wave, which is my right hand, now right arm. But on this same thing, the phase keeps advancing, and I'm going back to the other end. And now I end, so at this position, and I realize with that starting point and that end point, uh, I would not represent an eigenmode of a system. Because the eigenmode says uh, that here at a hard end, the uh, velocity has to be zero. And velocity zero means, uh, for example, that f minus g, uh, subtracting these two guys, has, has to be zero. So they have to point in the same direction. So if I end up like this, I'm not an eigenmode. I have to make sure my condition uh, or my, my acoustic states ends up like that. How could I do that? By changing the frequency. Because changing the frequency means I change the rate of, of rotation as I go along. High frequency is like this, right? At low frequency, it's just like, like that. OK, so let's say I can establish eigenmodes in a, in a resonator by just considering the waves going, going back and forth. And the, the important thing is uh, you need is, of course, um, microphones measure pressure, and they do not measure uh, these characteristic waves. So this here is an important relation. And to, to also get a very simple but important idea home that not everybody appreciates. So again, we would have here now a standing wave with a hard point termination here on this left side. Hard wall means velocity equals zero. That means, I just said this, same direction for the two characteristic waves. So here they're both pointing upward. The red is the wave traveling in the uh, plus x direction. The blue one represents the g wave traveling in the opposite direction. The sum of the two 
would be the pressure. Um, now, as I step a bit away from my reflection, just as it's seen before, the phase has changed. One goes in the uh, uh, clockwise direction, the other one rotates in the counterclockwise direction. The sum of the two is a pressure which decreases, as you can see here also. The diff difference between the two, so you take the blue vector, turn it up on its head, and again put the foot on the tip of the red one. So that's the uh, magenta. It changed from green to magenta. Yesterday evening, all red colors here because green didn't show that. Anyway, so that is the velocity. So you can see away from the wall also acoustic velocity starts to build up. You also see very naturally that in a standing wave, the phase between the pressure and the velocity is always 90 degrees. Because standing wave means the two guys here, the F and the G, have the same amplitude. But if you add two waves that have that are symmetric as far as the angle is, is concerned, the sum and the difference will always be at 90 degrees of each other. Okay, then you step further away from the hard wall boundary condition up to the first pressure node, so that is a uh, quarter of a wavelength now. So these guys have rotated a quarter of 360 degrees. And now the pressure is zero because they point in opposite directions. Some of the tools are pressure. Okay, pressure is zero. That's what we wanted to have a pressure node. And the velocity is maximum because this is just the sum of the two. Okay. And then you move further down, you move into the downstream of the, of the standing wave, so to speak. Again, pressure becomes large, velocity stays, phase between the velocity and pressure stays at maximum. Um, okay, so how can we use that? And I was really glad that uh, Nadine brought this problem up yesterday. Here we have a, a duct of a certain length, and at some position A, we have a change in cross sectional area. And the question that was raised yesterday, how does that affect the eigenfrequencies? Would they change to the increase to the decrease? And uh, of course, we saw yesterday how the, the equations looked like for a, a, a low order network model. And you can set the characteristic equation to zero and get the frequencies, and you see, you get the result. But I'm asking you to figure out, to, to think that we can figure this out just by thinking about the, uh, the phasers of the F and G wave. And all you need to know is actually uh, the coupling condition for the acoustic quantities. Right? You think, I don't know what happens to an F wave at a, at a, at a cross-sectional area. Maybe it will be reflected or transmitted or, or something will happen to it. Who knows what? But physics tells us, fluid dynamics tells us, well, at least simplest model we can have for an area change is this one, is that the pressures are the same on the uh, uh, upstream side and the downstream side. And the uh, volume flow rate is conserved. So the cross-section on upstream duct area times the velocity fluctuation is equal to the downstream cross-section area. Now, by simply considering what happens to my characteristic waves, you can figure out what happens at the area change. I, I give you three minutes now, if you want, to figure it out. And then you can have a poll. Who thinks that the frequency goes up? Who thinks that the frequency goes down? Who opts for constant frequency? You can do all this in your head. I usually draw an arrow on paper. And try to <coughs> Tumble fellows know the answer, but they don't, they don't know why it works out.
Parmit, for a particular small name, has AU by uh, AD increases. You mean the area ratio? Yeah. That is, can be larger or smaller than, I mean, if it's larger than unity, you have a narrow duct into a wider duct, or vice versa, both is possible. Yeah. Yeah. And there may no limits on much larger than one or close to one, it should be a general. So, uh, that was a long introduction. 
now to the uh, but we'll even need these ideas in, in what is to come. But now the thing about the, 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 the single microphone methods. Uh, you see pictures like this many times. You saw some in, in Nicolas talk also today. Uh, where you have a combustion test string and you have a microphone here. And an important point that is not always appreciated is that it's not trivial to have a microphone survive in the vicinity of a flame you know, with 2,000 uh, degrees Celsius temperatures and significant radiation of heat, significant thermal and so on. So, forth. so what you have to do is you have to have a, a microphone jacket, possibly waterproof, that protects your microphone from this heavy environment. And in principle, these microphone jackets look like this. Here is the sensor area of the microphone, both protected by some kind of grill. And this volume here, where the microphone sits, is connected with a small hole to the combustion chamber. This is a fine arrangement if you have low frequencies, because at low frequencies, if the pressure out here changes very slowly at low frequencies, there is all the time in the world for some flow into this volume until the pressure is here or equal, and the microphone measures whatever pressure is present out here. But of course, as frequencies go up, uh, you run into the problem that this system here, this uh, cavity with the neck here, is also an acoustic resonator. So it's a Helmholtz resonator. And if the frequencies come into the vicinity, uh, come up to the range of the Helmholtz resonator, it feels comfortable resonating in its high frequency. Your results are complete garbage. Your faces and your amplitudes are just plain wrong. So uh, you should always try to, of course, make these uh, jackets as small as possible to push up the resonant frequencies. Or another measurement principle, so-called semi-infinite tube. Uh, you have a tube affixed to your combustion chamber. Some distance away is your microphone with the sensor directly facing the, the tube. Uh, you can comfortably place the sensor now far away from the uh, combustion chamber. There is even space for some heat shielding and whatnot, so this doesn't need to be a waterproof jacket, preferably. And the problem of resonance of this slide, of this uh, connecting tube, you avoid that by making it very long. So it doesn't need to be infinity, but it can be 20 meters or whatever. And, and sometimes people even put a, a thread of wool or something in it because that increases the acoustic dissipation, so a wave that enters here, propagates along, and it never gets properly reflected, but just it dies out very, very gradually. And of course, for the phases, you have to correct for the fact that the distance here between the uh, combustion chamber location and the sensor location induces a certain phase delay, uh, but as far as the amplitudes goes, at least you're not suffering from uh, having to distortion by, by resonances. Uh, but of course, this has to be carefully calibrated. So that's all I wanted to say on the uh, single microphone method. Ah, okay, what I should say, of course, now, what you get from this is a time series of pressure fluctuations, and to turn this into a uh, amplitude phase of pressure fluctuation, that requires time series analysis, and we'll hear about that. But let's just assume we can, we know how to do this, we can uh, get the signal from the microphone and convert it into a pressure, which again will be a phaser. We have a gain in a certain phase, a certain direction in the context. And what do you do with that? Often you are not only interested in, in pressures, but you're also interested in acoustic velocities, and you're also interested in reflection coefficients or impedances, for example, if they have a determination here that is depicted in this situation. Uh, the basic idea is, is, is not so bad. No? The idea is, instead of saying I measure, I measure pressure and velocity, uh, acoustic velocity, at, at one location by using two different types of sensors, the microphone and the hot wire, for example, or the microphone and the apron, I can measure pressure at two positions. I know that the pressure field in such a duct is composed of 
waves running in the left direction, running in the right direction. So basically, I have two degrees of freedom. These two degrees of freedom determine, we've, we've seen that, how pressure and velocity are related to each other as you move along the tube. So it should be possible to, to start with two microphone measurements, reduce the uh, acoustic state, that is the amplitudes of the left and the right going characteristic waves. And from this, reconstruct the position, uh, the, the pressure at one location, what we have at the right anyway, but also the, the velocity at that location. And then pressure and velocity would give you the impedance, or the ratio of the two waves gives you the reflection factor. And with what I talked about before, this is easily explainable. So uh, we know that the waves, as they advance a bit, have a sort of phase change. This can be expressed with a phase propagator I call it here. So if I'm at position X and uh, move on to position J, you can ask how much does the phase of an F wave change? Well, you are plug in the numbers here. Uh, speed of sound, uh, frequency of oscillation, mock the mean flow of the plus sign that gives you the corresponding wave number for the right going wave, and then you have uh, this phase of that. Basically, the change in direction uh, associated with that distance between XJ and XR. So, <coughs> you can see that uh, if I know the characteristic waves at one location, I say I can easily compute the pressures at locations I and J. For location I, it's simply the sum. The sum of the Fs and the Gs is a PI. We've had that before. And at uh, location J, for the downstream in this case, say, uh, you multiply the two and reduce here with the phasor factors. We can also invert this relation, of course, most of the time at least. And that's exactly what two microphone methods are about. Now I am in a comfortable situation knowing the pressure of the two locations, which is easy to have two microphones. I can compute the amplitudes Fi and G I say at location I. I have everything I need to know. Now I can compute the genes and red factors and whatnot. It can become a little complicated. Uh, here I have a general result. The reflection factors or the ratio of left to right going wave and the corresponding phase at some position xk, somewhere within the duct, upstream, downstream, doesn't matter, can be given by, by this expression. Due to a brief annotation, I have introduced the pressure transfer function, so the, the ratio of pj divided by pi. So this is again like a complex, complex number because the ratio. So this is the most general result, but I can apply this now, for example, to compute the reflection factor at Ri, or more interesting, compute the reflection factor, for example, here, to uh, evaluate the reflection factor of an, of an outlet and termination condition. Or if I have some material here, porous material, absorbent material, for example, I can compute the factor at this position from the piece at I and XJ. And uh, this would be a little uh, homework exercise. You can very easily deduce this from the result that was given on the previous slide. And you find this also in many textbooks. But again, I think the derivation in Feynman style with the Riemann invariance, so to speak, is easier than the derivation you see in many textbooks. Okay. So, what have we got here? Oh yeah, right. So some some results now. This was now, as I said, going back to 1996, a long time ago, uh, when these two guys were sleeping away in the basement, trying to measure the reflection factor of an old pen. Now uh, that is not uh, a new thing to do. There is also an analytical expression, uh, which we also saw yesterday already in Alessandro's talk. Uh, this goes back to Levi Petrina in 1948, I think. They had some rather complicated, horrible paper uh, where they, uh, by functioning, spectrum, complex analysis, what not, they figured out 
what the reflection factor of a sharp ended up should be. But you can simplify this in some limit to this expression here. It's funny, Schwinger also was a quantum mechanicist. No? So I don't know, these guys, when they were born in quantum mechanics, they were doing the most complicated acoustics problems, it seems, to it, uh, in, in their past time. So uh, anyway, so this result says that the, uh, the absolute value increases, so k is again the wave number, uh, divided by the speed of sound. And a here is the diameter of, of the duct. So you see on the one hand, the reflection factor decreases with frequency as frequency goes up, k goes up, and the term in brackets decreases slightly uh, away from 1. And then there's an extra phase changer here. This, this delta is an effective length. And uh, the theory says that uh, this one should be about 0.66 or so. That should, uh, should be 0.66 times the diameter. So here we have uh, measurements uh, taken with a test rig where we had uh, five microphones installed. And for example, the, the, the continuous line here is we take the time series from microphone one and two, run them through the time series analysis, get the pressure tracture function, and evaluate for the various frequencies. So here we have omega, frequency times duct diameter divided by speed or something. Basically, this is your point of frequency. And you evaluate the reflection factor as a function of the frequency. The dash line here is the analytical result according to the image here. And again, the continuous line is from microphones one and two. And you see, while we sort of seem to get roughly the trend, but the agreement is not really satisfying. Now, of course, if I had five microphones, why use the first one and the second one? I could also use microphone number zero and one. Why not? Uh, and that's the grayish short dash line here, which looks uh, similar, but not necessarily better. Also, the best fit to these results, you now fitting this equation with uh, effective, with the uh, end correction as a free variable, gave a value of 0.76, so 0.66. So clearly we didn't do a very good job of this. Or plenty of them, right? We didn't do it on the one, because it was from a native view of the So uh, again, taking measurement three and four, or two and three, in different combinations. That's sometimes recommended that, uh, I'll come to in a minute. We see that, OK, at least the combination of three and four gives a lot better agreement. Uh, but then again, if you only have, if you have five microphones, and four out of five combinations give garbage, and you don't have the nice from level by Levi and Schwinger, how do you know which pair of microphones is the one you should trust? So this was very, very unsatisfactory. But still, short resume in between with the two microphone methods. If you use it, and people are still using it, I think also because what we had here was the case with mean flow. So the turbulent uh, contributions to the signal were quite significant, and that makes it a lot harder to do to make acoustic measurements. If you have a situation without me, if another two microphone is widely used, but widely widely used, <laughs> and it's not success. Uh, but you gotta be careful. Uh, you have to calibrate your microphones very importantly. Use a piston phone, whatever, to really make sure you know how you translate your voltage readings to pressure amplitudes and what the phase difference is in between and so forth. There is also a procedure of microphone switching, exchanging the two, and then correlating out the mistakes you're making. Again, reference to time series analysis. You don't just get the pressures as the FFT of the time signal, but you should correlate it with the excitation signal. And something I learned yesterday, so I just put it right away. It's the evening from the book. Uh, you can even uh, get a better estimate from, for the effective distance between the, the microphone locations from, from the acoustics if you have a known termination in your setup. So that's something that seems to be a wise thing to do. The problems are certainly low. If you are unfortunate and encounter a, sit a situation that is a frequency where a pressure uh, node, zero of pressure, is located at one of the microphone positions, then the procedure blows up. Because you have this PJ over PI, and if the pressure in the uh, uh, denominator is zero, then your transfer function becomes infinite or it becomes 
very prone to uh, garbageization by journalists. So. Another problem is, in a way, there is no check for for self consistency. You get this. You have these two microphones. You get. You have the procedure. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, as you have it here, you translate your pressure readings or your, your transfer functions into the impedance and reflection factor. But there is nothing in between that would tell you should I trust this result or should I not. And you don't know how to integrate extra data. And that is now where the, again, where the Feynman idea comes in. Uh, if you understand that, okay, all you're dealing with is two, two waves that are propagating through your duct and the phase is changing, but you only have two degrees of freedom, and, and, and these microphones sort of just pick up the sum of the two vectors at different locations, then the following idea here, all you have to do is say to, to fix m to n phase at some reference location at zero for the two waves, then you know how they propagate to the locations of your various microphones. <coughs> Then we say the nonlinear fitting procedure, try to fix those two guys such that this here becomes as small as possible, such they are optimal fit towards the measurement. The nice thing about this is if uh, one of the microphones with the pressure load, so the pressure is zero, nothing grows up. Uh, this, this thing is a lot better condition. Plus, if one of the microphones gets garbage because the calibration is wrong or the amplifier was going berserk or whatever. This tells you because the residual that you're going to have here will be large whenever one of the microphones is not fitting into this into this scheme. Basically you have an overdetermined system and you get a small residual only if everything is is, is uh, uh, going according to expectations. So that that I, I felt was a, a nice idea. Of course then I learned later that it's not a new idea. <laughs> I came across a paper by Peters with Malviko Jeschbeck, he was mentioned yesterday, the man who doesn't like experiments who said that. It's not his hobby, It's not his hobby, but he does the most precise measurements that anybody ever has done, I think, on, on these kind of problems. This is a paper with, uh, with uh, Peters from 93, where he uses a multi-microphone method. method. Then I learned from, from Zuchiv, when you heard it yesterday also, that the group at Georgia Tech even in the 70s, it's something that amounts to this procedure. And yesterday in, who was it? Who was it in the presentation? Somebody also cited it's going in 1988 as the inventor of the multi-microphone technique. Strange enough, papers and all again, but it seems they were not aware of that work either. So even the air acoustics community, there's no consensus. So anyway, it's a, uh, it's a nice technique, and if you look at uh, this is again the two microphone result, and again the fit here was 0.57 for uh, for the uh, end correction. If you do this, now this is the same data, right? Same set of data from the lab, just different post processing. Uh, you get uh, a lot better agreement, and you get also the right value for the uh, for the end correction, uh, with, simply with different post processing of the raw data. That is something. Um, so, things to consider again, uh, do the cross correlation or uh, Professor Tangira will talk tomorrow. More microphones are better, but of course, more microphones are also expensive. And if you have uh, 10 microphones in operation, the possibility that one of them breaks during the measurement is larger if you have n minus 1 microphones, and so on and so forth. Another recommendation. You should use a test trick setup where the reflection coefficient is low. That's something that we learned from Suchi also, where is he? <laughs> uh, because in, uh, we were applying this technique also in Munich, and for some setups, despite all the advantages, in turbulent flow, it's difficult. We had transfer matrix measurements, and the results were all over the place. Huge fluctuations. The measurement procedure was just not robust. And then Suchi says, hey, you guys, what is the and so this is the acoustic termination of the rig. And the termination is pretty much an open end with fairly high reflection coefficient. And here's the advice you should have a setup if possible where you have low reflection coefficient. Why? If you have low reflection coefficient, signal only propagates in one way. 
Now we've seen that the signal with a, a, a traveling wave, basically the phase of the pressure changes because uh, the well, because the pressure is pretty much equal to one of the correct characteristic waves. And microphones are pretty good at picking up small differences in phase. They're not so good at picking up quantitative differences in amplitude. If you have a standing wave fiber, uh, the pressure amplitude changes over distance, but the phase always stays constant, then it jumps, and then stays constant again. So if you have a standing wave setup, and you want to apply the multi-microphone method, also the two-microphone, to a, to a segment of a duct where a standing wave is, is living, it's much harder for that to get good results than if you have a traveling wave living in that, in that part. And that's why Lubos says big uh, absorbers at the end of the, of the test you can get KTH. Right? Uh, we also learned, again, generalizing this idea, if you are not quite sure what the temperature is of the gas you're working with, and in combustion chambers that is often the case, then you do not know what the speed of sound is. But you have to know what the speed of sound is because you have to know what the phase propagators are. How much, how much phase do I make if I, if I make propagates in it? That depends on the, on the speed of sound. Uh, so if you cannot measure this with thermocouples or whatever, you can, remember you have an overdetermined system. If there are four or five microphones, you could say, ah, my unknowns are the amplitude of the F wave, the amplitude of the G wave, and the speed of sound. And then you, you correlate, or you, you do your nonlinear optimization to find optimal, to, to find values of the speed of sound and F and G. Best fit. So that's an indirect way of uh, getting the speed of sound. And you can take this a step further and talk about this. You can also get model parameters really as part of the uh, of this regression problem. Okay. Further extension, Nicola mentioned that. Um, in the previous sketch we had uh, we were interested in measuring so the impedance at the downstream end with four micro. Uh, that would correspond to measuring one reflection coefficient. Uh, in general, in duct acoustics, uh, you have often a situation where an element, an area change, a flame, a, a nozzle, whatever, is placed in a duct and there is acoustic activity on both sides and waves that are coming from one side are transmitted or reflected and waves that are coming from the other side are transmitted or reflected. So the acoustic properties uh, of such an element in a, in a duct are not described by one reflection coefficient, but by four coefficients, which can be interpreted as two reflection coefficients and two transmission coefficients. Or if you switch back rotation from characteristic waves to the primitive acoustic variables to, uh, to the transfer matrix. Now, how can you measure this? Uh, here we have a problem here. With Four, four, four microphones here and four microphones here. I have uh, uh, two equations because I have the acoustic state here and the acoustic state there, coupling across. But I have four unknowns. I have four coefficients of the scattering matrix. So what you can do is you have to find a second set of equations, and you can realize this by having say, a different type of boundary condition. First, we have an open end. We do a measurement. Then we do a semi-transparent or non-reflecting and do a second measurement. And now I have four equations with four unknowns and I can solve for my own unknown coefficients. So this is a so-called two-load method for transfer matrix or scattering matrix reconstruction because you have two different loads, two different uh, terminations uh, active here. There's another ver variation which is often more successful, that's the two-source. We have two different sources. First, you try to have a speaker on the upstream side, have, say, non-reflecting transition condition on the other side. Then you switch the arrangement, have the speaker on the downstream side, again do the measurement, have again four equations, four nodes, and get the scattering matrix. And from this, you can get by algebraic uh, formulation and transfer matrix. So that is how it was so late. Uh, and now this was now again very old paper, 1998, the transfer matrix of a, a swirl burner 
But without the frame, this was all cold flow, and we had some, some simple models. Well, this model, the burn is much like an area change. It has a loss coefficient, and it is an effective length. And you could correlate uh, these parameters. The straight, the red lines of the model, the weekly ones are uh, the measurement results. And you see we get a lot of the features right. At higher frequencies, we have some discrepancy here. This, is, this should be zero, and this, very, well, this is also very hard to read. It's a very small antiquity. So this is pretty decent than that. But again, for the combusting case, measurement is much harder. OK, uh, oh, I should finish, actually. Yeah. Um, we heard from Maria's talk, it's hard to measure a flame transfer function because it's hard to measure heat release rate. The indirect way that, that Nicola mentioned today also is to get the transfer function from uh, acoustic measurements. And that is for a compact flame, at least you know how the flame transfer function, the ratio between heat release and velocity fluctuation, how that shows up in the co coupling coefficients for pressure and velocity across the flame. This is the analytical expression in the, in the cold flow case. And so this is, uh, you, you can do this and then deduce what your uh, transfer function looks like, for example, by looking at the T22 coefficient. You saw some results of this. Was, I think Bruno Schirmer, the last one, was the first to, uh, to, do, to do that kind of approach. So it's a, a non-optical way of getting the uh, transfer function. It can be applied also to oil burners and what not. It's difficult at high pressure, as you heard, because, again, acoustic measurements are, are tricky. And taking this idea, oh, I forgot to, oh, oh, a long time in here, sorry. <laughs> Taking this idea a bit further, it was worked on now fairly recently uh, by Alan Reddy and Fanaka and Hirsch and Sattelmeier, paper in IJNCD from three years ago. It is again this idea that you make model regression. I mean, already the multi microphone is model regression, where you know how the waves propagate uh, between the different stations where the microphones are. And you exploit that to construct, to determine model parameters, which were, in the multi microphone case, the amplitudes of the two waves that are the uh, entity that the model is, is concerned with. And you can extend this by saying, hey, what if I parameterize the dynamics of a flame with a certain flame transfer function model, which is characterized by a time length, a spread of time lengths? Two time lengths and two spreads of time lengths and various interaction units, so the, the main tau sigma. So I use several microphones to measure upstream. I have my uh, model for the cold burner as such. I have a model for the flame transfer matrix. I have my microphone readings, pressure transducer readings from the downstream side. And I stick all this into the regression relation just as for the multi microphone method. Uh, same idea as for getting the speed of sound from the measurement, but instead of getting speed of sound, you get flame model parameters out of the measurement. And then you can do this regression actually not only over one frequency, but over many frequencies. And thus your number of, your, your amount of data increases tremendously, and that's a, a much robuster way to get uh, results in your flame transfer. Of course, it requires that the model that you're assuming here is correct. Otherwise, garbage in, garbage out. But that applies for all kinds of uh, gray box model. And the last one, I think I'll skip that. Uh, this is exploratory thinking anyway. It hasn't gotten very far yet. Uh, so what is the conclusions? Microphones can measure um, pressure, so you know we knew that. They can also measure frequencies, obviously. Uh, perhaps it wouldn't think so, but they can measure velocities, and they can even measure heat release in particular. Oh, sorry, yeah, that too. <laughs> Not the heat release. And the uh, fluctuations, and perhaps even the distribution of heat release. This is what I want to talk about uh, in the last topic that I skipped. Uh, other things to take away these measurements are difficult, probably more difficult than I imagined, because I'm spent most of the time in front of the keyboard or with paper and pencil. Um, but I, it is my opinion that good experimentation in this field requires that you both understand the models and the situation, the physics that you're dealing with, uh, and the amplifiers and, and, and your, your piston flow and whatnot. 
So really, modeling and understanding and sophisticated thought processes is necessary, in addition to the, uh, the, the, the right touch to get good, to get good data. And, and last conclusion also is uh, referring back to find them very good books by smart people, if, even if they're not seemingly not related to the topic of research. Okay, thank you.
converts the pressure at the uh, combustor to something in the microphone location. So or, or it doesn't matter what the temperature is. We, we, we need to know the right pressure, and that's what drives the speed. So I think it, it, it should work. Okay, yeah. But this is hard. Just because I have a tennis racket or roller pressure doesn't mean I can win Wimbledon. So I just get to do it. Thank you.